Before I start, I just want to quickly say we are the sort of almost the epitome as a collective of this project. Our colleagues are from Bulgaria, Czech, Lithuania, England, and I'm actually third generation migrant. My family are Hungarian, Austrian, French, and Dutch. So in some ways, you know, we do encapsulate what this project's about. So we're going to start off each taking different elements. There's an awful lot to get through. We're going to be quick. Gary will probably be very cross with us because we might overrun, but I'm sure he can shut us up if he needs to. You have the full report available on your pen and drive, and we're happy to circulate the presentation slides if that would be helpful as well. So it's going to be a super quick whisk through and time to ask questions later. Semi, would you like to do the slides? Okay. So you can see the title, it's the impact of migration in the Finland area. Um, you've heard quite a lot about this report to start with, and I'm going to zip through on the next slide to tell you a bit, little bit about what we're doing. So it was part of the overall suite of controlling migration fund programmes, and as you've already heard, the original programme is to understand the impacts of migration across the Fenland district and planning to meet post-Brexit challenges. Our particular project explored the impact of migration on local population, looking at trends, employment, labour market, demographics, residential patterns, and a range of educational health, housing, community cohesion issues. And it took a year for us to undertake this project. Thanks. Okay, the research team, you've already met the academic team, but I want to really, really thank our colleagues at Rosmini and David from Fenland Council. It was full co-production. We worked together incredibly closely, engaged at all elements and all issues, and shared data gathering and discussed what we were going to do. And I'd also like to thank our Rosmini Centre colleagues who undertook translation when, when it couldn't be covered by members of our team. A little bit about the research methods. It was quite a complex project. There were two newly generated data sets. So colleagues at Rosmini, they administered a questionnaire to all new clients who came to them over simply a three-month period. And in that time, there were 220 newly registered service users in that sort of very short time frame. So you can see how many people they're actually dealing with. A number of questions were asked, such as intent to migrate, what sort of accommodation, what type of employment, and we'll flag up some of that data for you in a few moments. In addition, I want to thank our colleague Rachel here, who's also part of uh, the LGA, East of England LGA, and worked with us on some of this project collated um, a sort of a range of stakeholder networks and sent out another questionnaire survey which we developed to ask them about the work they were undertaking, range of networks, main community languages, the chief difficulties which they saw impacting migrant workers. And all of those networks, of which over 320 were contacted, and I'll point out later, very few actually were able to respond, which was a major challenge for us. But of those who did respond, we had employers, we had public sector service providers, education, health, um, I think social care, a whole range of people, and Fenland uh, District Council, NGOs as well, so voluntary sector. So we reached out very, very widely to a wide range of contacts. We also undertook, thank you, Sammy, a literature, so I don't mean too quickly, I mean this is what you did, uh, literature and media reviews. So we fed in, and this was led on by Sammy. We had the analysis of the Rosmini data undertaken by Yana, who's there in the back, and as I've already indicated, Rachel worked with us on networking. We then also carried out secondary analysis of all the existing administrative data sets we could find, so health, education, uh, where it existed. And there are a significant number of gaps, things that we really required which aren't in the public domain. So, for example, it would have been helpful to have found out about you know, policing issues where there's contacts between migrant workers and the criminal justice system or social services. We couldn't access any of that data. So there's a number of caveats on what we found. We then went out and did qualitative interviews and focus groups. That's a whole saga in itself, and you'll see that within the report, how challenged it was to actually get people to take part in interviews. Public sector, again, major problems, as Gary's also found, 
in getting people to engage. But ultimately, we carried out interviews with nine migrant workers, and we had quite a big sampling frame to get people from a range of countries with different experiences, whether they had dependents or not, how long they've been in the UK. So nine migrant workers, seven public sector workers, one voluntary sector agency, and fly, five employers, of which some were agencies employing a large number of migrant workers, and some were direct employers. We then triangulated all the findings, produced a report, and the policy recommendations that you're going to hear about later. And I'm now going to hand you over to Aigne. Thank you very much. So as uh, European Union lawyers, exciting times to, to, to be and work in, in these <laughs> Uh, times. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about legal context, and that already has been uh, highlighted by a number of speakers. Issues such, you know, HMO compliance, modern slavery, working conditions. Um, not much talk has been yet about welfare benefits, and a little bit about the uh, EU settlement scheme, or as known as settled and pre-settled status. So um, we'll talk kind of as we, as we talk now. We will talk a little bit more on that. In terms of um, demographic uh, demographics of, of, of the location, um, we found that actually the PE13 postcode stood out in our administrative data set, where over 91% of migrant workers um, were living in that postcode. Again, that might highlight issues about overcrowding. Um, the area was within the 10% most deprived neighborhoods, which again shows uh, the, the, the social economic context. In terms of the largest migrant uh, groups, we identify Lithuanians, Romanians, and um, Bulgarians. Um, another interesting thing to kind of highlight is about the age of, of the workers, uh, where 41% um, they were between 18 and 30 years uh, old. So that shows quite a young population. Again, needs to be taken into account when we talk about healthcare provision. And when we look at the gender division, we see that men, uh, and age div the division, we see men migrate younger than women, and perhaps that women follow uh, you know, children and so on. So um, in terms of dependence, we found that more women had dependents uh, than men. So some uh, diagrams, to an interesting uh, highlighting point for us to find out that actually most arrivals were very recent and 2018 saw quite a big uh, influx of arrivals. In terms of nationalities, I already highlighted the three um, largest groups um, <coughs> were uh, Bulgarian, Lithuanian, and uh, Romanian in our um, 220 data set. So what, what is the intention in terms of uh, future migration and Brexit planning? Um, quite a large number, 73.2% of migrant workers, they said they are going to intend to settle permanently. Um, those who are saying not to go into settle permanently, they are planning to reside uh, two years or less. So that's their, um, their, their plans. In terms of Brexit uncertainty, um, we found that uh, some reflected it as a worry, some didn't, um, but there was not necessarily a specific plan in place for, for migrant workers, or it is in terms of their own. They, most of them, they were, let's wait and see what happens. However, Rosmini's data and the demand for advice about the EU settle, settlement scheme indicates that there is an increasing demand for assistance. So uh, just between August and October this year, Rosmini received 586 requests for assistance. So it only shows the, the number of, of demands that is required. Um, and, and just to kind of re reinstate the main finding that most of the people are in the data set indicated to, to settle permanently rather than uh, temporarily. Okay, um, thanks, Edgley. I'm just going to talk briefly through some of the information we collected on employment. We, in addition to the statistical surveys, we also interviewed local employers, agencies, and a representative of uh, an organization representing labor providers. 
Uh, what we found is that the following uh, sectors were the largest employers, horticulture, agriculture, food processing, etc., which also tend to pay uh, relatively low wages. Um, employment rates were high. Over 70% were in employment, and this is higher than the national and regional average. We've also seen increasing rates of national insurance registrations, um, and as we see in the survey, almost half the sample arrived in 2018. The vast majority arrived since 2010, uh, and so just reflecting what the employers and other uh, people told us, that it's um, labour market opportunities that are drawing people to the area. The, um, a high number were employed via agencies, though it must be said most of the agencies we spoke to said that they were able to give their workers continuous work, which relates to the labour shortages in the area, though there were national differences, as you can see. Over 40% are Lithuanians. Um, in terms of employment rights, and this is based on national data, you can see less than half of those working in agriculture receive paid holidays, less than a third paid sick leave, and many without written contracts. So in the discussions we had with the employers and agencies, they said they did provide information on benefits, entitlement, et cetera, maternity rights with their female um, workers as well. So just briefly looking at this, we can see that the vast bulk of the people that uh, undertook the survey were largely working in uh, sort of like relatively low paid work, um, factory work, etc., field work, line work, food production were all major sectors. So this, of course, it's likely to be an artifact of how and where the data was collected. The surveys were collected at Rosmini. Um, a lot of the employers told us they had a, there were significant proportions of migrants working in mid-level and super, supervisory roles though these would not have been, probably wouldn't have been accessing Rosmini to complete the surveys. Uh, and they pointed out also, particularly among those that have, have been here longer, Polish, for example, that were underrepresented, they said that there's um, a fair amount of Polish working in, in these kind of positions. Okay, next one. Oh. Um, talking to the employers, they, it, it, Commonly, it was stated that they're having trouble filling their vacancies, though this predates the referendum. Um, this tended to start around 2015. Found similar things in other sectors as well, such as health and social care. Though we're not touching on that here, um, but it seems to reflect a wider pattern of um, labour supply. Uh, but as a result of this, of course, if the if labour's in shorter supply, then this has the effect of pushing up wages and conditions, and this was also uh, emphasised to us in some of the interviews, um, particularly in, in regards to competition from other countries as well, such as Germany, that pay better and is also known to have um, superior accommodation, so it's forcing employers to up their stakes somewhat. With regards to Brexit, uh, there's a variety of approaches. Some of the larger companies were investing more in machines and automation, though as was pointed out, that's not viable for everybody, particularly for the smaller employers that are working on relatively low overheads. Uh, others are considering relocating closer to the sources of labour supply. Instead of them coming here, they're going to they're considering moving closer to where they are uh, and also seeking new ways of attracting migrant labour. Some thought that because the agricultural workers were such an important component of the local workforce that the post-Brexit migration system would remain relatively liberal for those workers, though there was a lot of uncertainty and um, just wait, wait to see really. Uh, 
And one other thing I'll just briefly touch on is a change in the demographics of the workforce. Um, workers, uh, and this was touched upon earlier, workers tend to be, or more recent ones, tend to have lower skills, um, poorer English skills, and also in their own language to, to be, have relatively low literacy, uh, and to be older, and to come from more rural areas in their own countries. So I'll just hand back to Egli, who's going to talk a little bit about welfare benefits. Thank you. So one of the themes we looked at um, is how much welfare support an in the video that we just saw was mentioning about wel welfare benefits. Interesting um, kind of uh, contradictory messages came through to two different uh, groups of uh, people. One is the migrant workers who said uh, their awareness of welfare benefits was very low, uh, with Romanian nationals having the least likely to be aware. And then in contrast, the employers and employment agencies, work support specialists said that in their experience, the, the migrant workers' uh, awareness of welfare benefits was high. And again, it depends whether you speak to the employed people who may have slightly, slightly higher skills or whether you, know, uh, you capture a slightly wider, more diverse uh, range of uh, types of people. Perhaps that's what it was. Um, very low numbers in sickness or disability benefits, um, and only 10% of the overall sample claim child benefit, even though, as we said, 49% women had dependents uh, uh, with them in our sample of 220. So overall, one in five claimed uh, or received some sort of benefit of some sort of type. So that's, uh, that's the overall welfare benefit finding. Um, and just to kind of highlight the, the graph that most were not claiming uh, uh, benefits, only one in five. Okay. I'm going to now speed up and try and catch up on time. So I'm going to talk about health, which is one of my main areas of research and therefore key interest. What we found from these various sort of diverse data sets and our interviews was that most migrant workers are making very low use of health services. And we refer there to the healthy young migrant effect, which is a well-known phenomenon. People are younger, fitter, healthier, you know, often don't make use of health services. We found that where people did need access to healthcare, it was often supported by agencies such as the Rosmini Center or by relying on family and friends in one case, someone referred to their landlady who took her to a GP when her child was sick. Often people have very limited knowledge of how UK health services operate, and that seems to vary depending on country of origin. And once again, we find that Romanians seem to be least well informed, and again, quite often most reluctant to come into contact with statutory services. And that's the theme which emerged whether it was applying to job centres, health services, education. So I think there's something going on there, perhaps, regarding relationships with bureaucracy and prior experience. I think the other point worth saying is we have anecdotal evidence that quite a number of people who self-identify as Romanian are Roma, and obviously, although they're not claiming to be Roma, but we obviously know there's a lot of challenges with how Roma experience discrimination and relationships with the states, and that could be something which needs further exploration, and uh, we'll look into later. Generally, people were going to hospitals when they were ill, and that's to do with perhaps not having access to GPs. We all have those challenges getting GP appointments, but also if someone's working long hours, um, perhaps has, you know, often has not had access to preventative screening, someone's generally far more likely to end up using emergency health care. Translation barriers, translation issues, getting access to translators, and language barriers, massively difficult, came out again and again in public sector interviews and data that we gathered, so not just in health settings, but also in education. So it's something that definitely needs to be worked around. It's a, a very common theme, and that's highlighted by both migrant workers, thank you, and, so, and providers. Okay, second bit of health. Uh, one of the things that's emerged from our data set is you're getting growing levels of chain migration. So you have people who are coming with family who follow, and that came out in some of Jake's films as well, and also when we interview service providers and schools. So granny might come over to help with childcare or more extended family members, and you get that settlement. It's great in terms of over time there's going to be higher levels of integration, 
and you're going to have people settling into you know, local context. But what it does mean is we're now beginning to see older people who are needing care, and there's often a lack of cultural awareness and language skills. Now, over time, sort of thinking my sort of health economics and demographics hat on, what it means is, like any other community, we're going to see increasing numbers of older people needing support with care, and, for example, around Alzheimer. At the moment, there seems to be a complete lacuna in planning for that, so it's something we really need to think about. Simultaneously, um, and this is something that came out in some of the education interviews as well, if this proposed threshold of £30,000 for migrant workers come to UK comes into play, that means there's going to be significant barriers in actually enabling migrant workers who've got cultural competence and a range of skills to come in and settle who might be providing education support and care for older people. So I'd like to flag that up as something that needs future planning. The other thing we know from literature, and it's been tentatively suggested in some interviews, is that migrant populations from those three key communities, Lithuanian, Bulgarian, and Romanian, are more likely to experience increased levels of high-risk conditions, such as heart disease, liver cirrhosis, cancer, respiratory disease, increased suicide rates. Okay, so we're looking across the European literature. We don't yet know, needs more research, but we think there's a very high likelihood that's going to map across for various public health reasons we could go into later. There's also suggestions in literature and some of our interviews there's increased risk of poor mental health for migrant workers, often to do with stress, isolation, poor living and working conditions, things that we've heard about within the films and from other speakers. We also know from some of our interviewees that mental health conditions are highly, highly stigmatised. So if someone's experiencing stress, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, they are very, very unlikely to go forward and seek help. So that's, again, another of our key recommendations. There needs to be further work around this, both research and thinking about planning and outward engagement. Thank you. Next one. Uh, housing, I'm just going to whisk through this because we're already over time. You've heard a lot about housing. So we've got all those general policy concerns about unhygienic and unsafe living conditions. I quickly want to just flag up, most people are completely unaware of decent home standards, safety regulations, and their legal rights to housing. That can also be if someone would be entitled to apply for public sector housing. The main areas of support received by IAG's information advice and guidance organisations, such as Osmini and local authorities have interviewed, pertain to accommodation issues, the so social housing application, poor understanding of council tax, someone can get into debt or don't realise they can access accommodation, complaints about private sector accommodation and homelessness and rough sleeper. Uh, I want to also flag up, this has come up a couple of times today and does in our education findings, residents in HMOs, houses of multiple occupancy, create safeguarding concerns. That came up in a, a number of interviews. So you've got children or vulnerable adults living with unrelated people, limited space, poor conditions. So there can be real risks here, real concerns, and often a lack of awareness, or you know, typically a lack of awareness amongst migrant workers of this risk, and an immense fear of statutory social services or other agencies coming into contact with them as a result of some of those concerns. Okay, over to David quickly. Okay, again, just very briefly to run through some of the findings, we spoke to two primary schools locally, both who had around half of their pupils with English as an additional language, um, high levels of poverty in the school and area, both among the UK and non-UK pupils, which does put significant pressure on the schools in terms of meeting the needs of all their pupils, uh, and particularly within uh, EAL. And despite the tight budgets and resource implications of this, the schools were both running various initiatives, both to support the um, children with EAL and also to integrate the children and their parents into the school and the school community more widely. You can see the range, that's just some of the activities going there. Uh, though they are... Con the, the, Post-Brexit, there were concerns about the 30,000 um, minimum threshold that means that they would possibly no longer be able to recruit bilingual staff. Okay. 
Uh, again, the, both the schools noted uh, an initial reluctance by parents to get involved, but over time they're finding increasing parental involvement in school activities and events. Uh, they were generally, they, the, the academic attendance and performance was generally high, but the problems come in the early years when the children come, they often don't have any English at all, uh, and they find it difficult to reach the key stage two targets. But after that, they said that generally attendance, motivation, and uh, outcomes are very good. Uh, and they're among the older pupils, the migrant um, pupils predominate among the highest achieving pupils. Uh, they did raise safeguarding concerns. A lot of them have been touched on already. Um, particularly around living in HMOs, uh, children caring for siblings while their parents were working, or unrelated adults living in the same house, um, looking after the children while their parents were working. Uh, they also touch upon issues of alcohol, alcoholism and, and domestic violence. Uh, and they also play an important signposting role in uh, signposting parents to various services such as Rosmini and other local services. Oh, community cohesion. Yes, Me as well. Yes, okay. That's there. Uh, regards community cohesion, again, we, there's been a lot spoken about that throughout this morning. Um, some of the concerns, again, they've already been discussed, there's no need to discuss them again, but I'll just point out with regards to street drinking, um, some, of the, some of the people we spoke to pointed out it's also been an issue for several years among UK-born locals, but it doesn't tend to um, cause so much controversy. Uh, and also, as one pointed out, a lot of these uh, people are working night shifts and so street drinking in the early mornings to them is, is street drinking, af is, is drinking after work. Uh, and also crowded housing, living in HMOs, another reason why people might be drinking in, in public places. There are very mixed views about integration locally. Some thought that it was, um, uh, most of them thought that it wasn't as bad as it's been portrayed in the media. Some thought that on the whole community relations were good uh, and others said it's not so good. But certainly the employers all said that um, workplace relations tend to be good. Some of the factors hindering better integration was, as we've seen, 91% were concentrated in one postcode. Um, HMOs, people tend to live with co-nationals. Uh, long and unsocial working hours, uh, and also community groups based around nationality and language was, were some of the factors raised. Uh, and the other things we've touched on with regards to the schools, um, certainly parents with children um, obviously tend to develop more contacts outside of their own national groups. So I'll hand back to Margaret now, who's just going to do the start. policy recommendations. So you've all been very patient, as has our chair. So I'm going to just zip yeah. through this. First of all, improved data collection and sharing. Now, we've heard about some mechanisms. Certainly, our experience of trying to contact a range, particularly public sector organisations, it's difficult to get that data to find out what's going on. There was phenomenal amounts of work went in. So we feel there needs to be far better data collection and sharing it needs second one, thanks, uh, to be in real time, really, this intelligence sharing. It's no good people to get together every few months. There's a time lag. And meanwhile, you've had new waves of migrants. There also needs to be better data sharing protocols. We were tearing our hair out trying to get information, despite doing this project with a lot of buy-in. So that needs to be worked on three things. Mm -hmm. Yep, preparation required to support workers applying for the EU settlement scheme. We've seen already how many people are coming forward. Mm -hmm. More and better information using a wider range of community languages. And that brings us on to four, better access to information generally. So collaborative service delivery, make use, for example, of IAG staff such as Rismini, who are multilingual, to help deliver services, to help deliver training information, perhaps through apps or podcasts, which can be about health. I have a big thing about health, a lot of my research is health. Pop-up immunisation centres, survival screening, 
cancer screening, those sort of things, work together, spread that information using community languages. Um, we feel, although there were a lot lower levels of community tension than the media would have it, it was something which did emerge in some interviews. Particular fact, there was this complete solid emphasis about the work ethic of migrant workers compa you know, compared with local UK-born workers. In terms of enhancing cohesion and also improving economic well-being for everybody in that area, we feel there needs to be incredibly, there needs to be very targeted deliberate labour force participation work to engage the local UK indigenous population. Okay. Um, recommendation six, tailored individual support for migrant workers. Okay. But it needs to fit in with their working patterns. So it's got to be flexible. Again, this could be through apps. It could be about accessible locations. Rosmini and other agencies are doing brilliantly. But let's think about other ways through these shared forums where people get together to be able to roll out opportunities as a one-stop shop. So whether it's welfare benefits, housing, someone's got a concern about child protection. Innovative English language learning. Without having a shared language, as we've seen, that impacts on community cohesion and access to a whole range of services. Apps, learning opportunities, use community spaces. You know, perhaps there could be lunchtime language classes that are going on in places of employment if there's space. Real-time data on local labour market trends. So I think we just, instead of doing this project that we've just done, and that's great and it goes away and it's finished, you need to keep this data coming need to work with those agencies to ensure that there's a sort of roll-on model because we've seen how much the ways of migration have changed over time and increasing sort of populations in particular countries. If this has been proposed, there's more people come from perhaps Ukraine and other, you know, out of EAA areas, which is one suggestion proposed by work by employers to bring in extra migrant workers. You need to know what's happening. You need to be able to engage, deliver services. Um, and finally, which of course we would say that, further research. And we feel this has got to be to address those gaps in knowledge. Mental health needs. We've already flagged up there's a problem, but nobody knows what's occurring, what are those barriers and challenges. Population demographics, educational trends. Where are those gaps? What can be done to fill them? What is going on more broadly than those very few schools who, came in, who actually got in touch with us, despite us emailing and trying to contact lots of schools for information? Housing conditions, more and better work, use of public services. Particularly, I want to emphasise this thing around child protection. It's come up, safeguarding's come up on several occasions in our research, and we've heard from other people. Nobody's doing research into it. Nobody knows what's going on. Nobody really knows what the barriers are. We can extrapolate from other research our team have done, from working with Roma around child protection, fear, concerns, you know, myths, rumours, challenges you can't deal with if you're living in a horrible shared house but someone needs to do some work and really drill down deeply. And that's it from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>